J.R.R. Tolkien begins his essay on fairy stories, understandably enough, with the question, what is a fairy story? And he's going to spend a good bit of the first part of the piece trying to disentangle what fairy stories in, let's call it a proper sense, are from what other people in a more loose, even sloppy terminology will call fairy stories so that he can zero in on what is genuinely essential. And that's going to allow him to throw away or expurgate some of the candidates for fairy stories. And he begins, as we often should, by saying, don't go to the dictionary because that is not actually going to help you. It's a knee-jerk reaction that many people have to think, ooh, if I have to figure out what the meaning of a word is, I'd better go to the dictionary and that'll tell me exactly what it is. It'll give me the essence of the thing. And Tolkien says, uh, in this case, you will turn to the Oxford English Dictionary in vain. And so, you know, it's not just any dictionary. It's the Oxford English Dictionary. And why? He says, well, it contains no reference to the combination fairy story and is unhelpful on the subject of fairies generally. In the supplement, fairy tale is recorded since the year 1750. And then he gives a you know tripartite uh, definition of this. Its leading sense is said to be A, a tale about fairies, or generally a fairy legend with developed senses, B, an unreal or incredible story, and C, a falsehood. And then Tolkien says, B and C are so broad that this could not possibly help us to understand what a fairy, fairy uh, story is. You know, any falsehood can be a fairy story. So he says, the first sense, though, is too narrow. Not too narrow for an essay. It's wide enough for many books, but too narrow to cover actual usage. And then he says, okay, if we look at the definition of fairies that's being given there, maybe that'll help us, right? And there's three elements to this as well. He says, supernatural beings of diminutive size and popular belief supposed to possess magical powers and have great influence for good or evil over the affairs of men. And then he says, all right, let's think about this. Supernatural? Yeah, kind of. He says, supernatural is a dangerous and difficult word in any of its senses, but to fairies, it can hardly be applied unless super is taken merely as a superlative prefix. So saying that, you know, they're in some sense greater, right? And he gives this great uh, little line, a set of lines here. Oh, see you ye not yon narrow road so thick beset with thorns and briars. That is the path of righteousness, though after it but few inquires. And see you not yon braid, braid road that lies across the lily leaven. That is the path of wickedness, though some call it the road to heaven. So two so far, right? And see you not yon bonny road that winds about yon fairny bry. That is the road to fair elf land where thou and I this night mount guy. So, you know, supernatural, yes, but not within the framework of, say, the Christian conception of the supernatural. What about diminutive? He says, well, this is indeed a notion that's quite common in modern times. And he says, of old, there were indeed some inhabitants of fairy that were small, but smallness was not characteristic of the people as a whole. That's more a function of modern storytelling and the need to make fairies tiny and delicate and, and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, he says that's really not the case in a lot of fairy stories. Um, what about being powerful? Well, you know, it, it is uh, something that comes up quite a bit, right? And they do have some degree of influence on the fates of human beings, if human beings are involved with them. Tolkien is going to say, people have gotten this kind of backwards. They're trying to define fairy stories by referencing fairies, a kind of beings, right? Really what they should be referencing is something different. Fairy, a land. 
a realm. And so he says, fairy is a noun more or less equivalent to elf is a relatively modern word, right? And uh, then he talks about the folk of fairy, meaning this, this land. And he says that, um, here we go. The trouble with the real folk of fairy is they do not always look like what they are. They put on the pride and beauty we would fain wear ourselves. At least part of the magic they wield for the good of evil, uh, good or evil of man, is the power to play on the desires of his body and his heart. And he says, um, stories about fairies too narrow, but stories about fairy, the land. Now we're on to something. He says, um, I've digressed from my proper theme, fairy stories. I said the sense stories about fairies was too narrow. It's too narrow, even if we reject the diminutive size for fairy stories are not a normal English usage stories about fairies or elves, but stories about fairy, that is fairy, the realm or state in which fairies have their beings. And what other kinds of beings are there? He says it contains many things besides elves and fays. And besides dwarves, witches, trolls, giants, or dragons, it holds the seas, the sun, the moon, the sky, and the earth, and all things that are in it, tree and bird, water and stone, wine and bread, and ourselves, mortal men, when we are enchanted. So the definition of fairy story is really going to depend on the nature of this land of fairy, the, what he calls the perilous realm itself and the air that blows in that country. Now, is that susceptible of definition? Tolkien says, no, you cannot define this land. And he says, I'm not even going to describe it directly. It cannot be done. Theory cannot be caught in a net of words. For it is one of its qualities to be indescribable, though not imperceptible. It has many elements, but analysis will not necessarily discover the secret of the whole. It can be described and it must be described, in, in fact, in narratives, but we can't constrain it through these nets of words, he's saying. And he goes on and talks about the purposes of fairy tales in a very interesting way. Before that, he says, I will say this, a fairy story is one which touches on or uses fairy, and then he brings in purposes, whatever its own main purpose may be. And he gives four, this is not a necessarily exclusive or exhaustive list, satire, adventure, morality, or fantasy. He also says that fairy may be uh, most nearly translated by magic, but its magic is of a peculiar mood and power at the furthest pull from the vulgar devices of the laborious scientific magician. And he gives us a proviso as well. If there is any satire present in the tale, one thing must not be made fun of the magic itself. That must in the story be taken seriously, neither laughed at nor explained away. And he gives uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight as a prime example of that. So there's multiple possible motives uh, for the narratives that comprise fairy tales. It does involve magic. And a little bit later, he's going to tell us something important about the magic that is rather determinative of fairy tales. He says, the magic of fairy is not an end in itself. Its virtue is in its operations. Among these are the satisfaction of certain primordial human desires, really basic things that we, we all experience, even if we're not fully conscious of. And what are some examples? To survey the depths of space and time, to, to explore, to find out, right? Our human curiosity. Another, he says, is to hold communion with other living things, right? And so a story that involves these, he says, approaches fairy stories and genuine fairy stories do involve these. The other thing that he says that helps us wrap our head around what a fairy tale is, he says it's essential to a genuine fairy story 
that it should be presented as true. And he uses true in quotes or brackets there. The meaning of true in this connection, he says, I'll consider later on, but the fairy story cannot tolerate any frame or machinery suggesting that the whole story in which they occur is just a figment or illusion. It has to, on some level, be presented as a object of belief, albeit what Tolkien will call secondary belief in this. He also engages in what he is willing to label as expurgations. He is throwing out certain things as not being fairy stories, even though some people would call them that. And so one of the types that he, he says um, is, uh, v you know, traveler's tales that feature little people. He says, um, consider a voyage to Lilliput, which is in the blue fairy book. I will say this, it is not a fairy story, neither as its author made it, nor as it here appears condensed by Miss May Kendall. It has no business in this place. Why? Because the fact that Lilliputians are tiny by comparison to, you know, say Gulliver or somebody like that, doesn't make them, you know, inhabitants of the realm of fairy. And he says, smallness is in fairy as in our world only an accident. Pygmies are no nearer to fairies than are Patagonians. I do not rule this story out because of its satirical intent. I rule it out because the vehicle of the satire belongs to the class of traveler's tales, which may include many marvels, but are not for that fairy tales because they're not about fairy land. They're about other lands, right? So we can eliminate those. And then going to the issue of truth, he says, I would rule out any story that uses the machinery of dream or the dreaming of actual human sleep to explain the apparent occurrence of its marvels. At the least, even if the reported dream was in other respects in itself a fairy story, I would condemn the whole as gravely defective. It is a good picture in a disfiguring frame. And he says, it's not that dream is not connected at all with fairy, but it's something different, right? Uh, he says, in dreams, strange powers of the mind may be unlocked. In them, a man may for a space wield the power of fairy. A real dream may indeed sometimes be a fairy story of almost elvish ease and skill while it is being dreamed, but you wake up from the dream. <laughs> and so, you know, and then you say, oh, it was just a dream as we do, you know, it's become kind of a trope in uh, a lot of uh, uh, narratives that, that we have ourselves. So those are not fairy tales. And then finally, he's going to rule out one other kind. Um, and again, he says, it's not because I don't like it. Pure beast fable, right? All these stories about, you know, whatever, monkeys or sharks or the three little pigs, perhaps, or all these sorts of things. These are actually beast or animal fables, right? And he says they have a connection with fairy stories. Beasts and birds and other creatures often talk like human beings in fairy stories, right? And they perhaps stem from one of the basic primal desires, the desire to hold communion with other living things. But the speech of beasts in the beast fable has developed into a separate branch, has little reference to that desire, and often wholly forgets it, right? So, you know, he says, in stories in which no human being is concerned or in which the animals are the heroes and heroines and men and women, if they appear are mere adjuncts, Above all those in which the animal form is only a mask upon a human face. In these, we have the beast fable and not a fairy story. Whether it be Reynard the fox or the nun's priest's tale or Br'er Rabbit or merely the three little pigs. And he says, there are some borderline cases like the stories of Beatrix Potter lying near the borders of fairy but outside of it. Their nearness is due largely to their strong moral element, right? So they're sort of allegorical. And so these are not, uh, in his view, fairy tales either. And this gives us a good sense of, if not a definition, at least what we can count as fairy tales. 
And what falls out of their purview, even though people may use that term for them rather imprecisely.